sorry, I'm really sorry. So welcome, uh, really, everyone. Really appreciate your cooperation. Uh, the IDC lunch, uh, post-election lunch. <laughs> uh, that, uh, I just want to, I, I don't want to get into politics, just to make one uh, uh, comment uh, related to astronomy. Um, the exoplanetars often define habitability just in terms of water. They say, if there is liquid water on the surface, that's enough. Uh, but it may not be enough. Uh, there might be uh, politics involved, and uh, that also affects habitability of planets. Uh, however, that's much more difficult to measure. Um, and uh, we will actually start with a, a talk on, on, on uh, exoplanets. Um, but uh, I just want to mention before I get to the list of speakers uh, that we heard an excellent uh, colloquium by Ellen Zweibel. Uh, we'll speak uh, later at this lunch. We'll start with uh, our own uh, Jane Birkin, who will talk about the uh, fingerprints of other worlds towards a high resolution view of Proxima B, the planet that was announced uh, back in uh, August this year. Then we'll hear from uh, Chris Carilli, uh, who is visiting us and will give the CFA colloquium later today. And he will talk about the aspects and the new next generation very large array. Uh, and after that, we'll hear again from Ellen, uh, who will talk about the galactic green termination shocks. And we'll conclude with Aaron uh, Ewald Weiss uh, from MIT, that will tell us about calibrating radio telescopes to detect uh, the cosmic dome. Jane. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm here to talk to you about a prime piece of real estate that's just opened up in your area. Potentially. Um, this talk is going to be about Proxima b, which is uh, our nearest um, rocky exoplanet orbiting Pro um, Proxima Centauri, the small uh, red star. And you can just about see uh, Alpha Cent A and B here in this artist's impression as well. Um, and so the question is, uh, does this planet have an atmosphere? And if it does, is it, um, does it contain biomarkers? Is it a habitable planet? Um, and this is uh, an idea for just one of uh, very few ways in which we might be able to determine that. Um, so just in case you're unaware, um, this is what the radial velocity curve looked like from um, Proxima b. And it orbits in the habitable zone of um, Proxima Centauri at about 11 days. Uh, and it's 1.3 parsecs away. And so most of the um, techniques that we have to characterize the atmospheres of exoplanets rely on the fact that they transit. However, it seems like Proxima b does not do this. And so we're like, oh, what do we do? Um, however, the fact that it doesn't transit is not really a surprise. Um, a former grad student here, Courtney Dressing, she did a study of the occurrence rate of small planets around small stars um, and determined that the nearest uh, transiting one that would be in, in a potentially habitable zone was about 11 parsecs away. Um, but the nearest non-transiting one would be somewhere around two and a half parsecs away. So she wasn't that far out. Um, but what that means is that before we reach one of these, there are about 200 other M dwarfs in our local solar neighborhood that if they do have planets, they're probably not transiting. And so if we want to understand our very nearest neighboring uh, star systems and their planets, then we need another way to understand the atmospheres of those planets without them transiting. And so while all, transits, <laughs> while all planets may not transit, they do all do something like this. They're all orbiting, they're all moving um, with varying speeds. And so you're probably familiar with this type of diagram, seeing um, spectral features, blue shift and red shift from the Doppler wobble technique for actually detecting planets. And that's when you're looking at the velocity change of the star. Now, what I'm going to show you today is the technique that actually looks directly at the thermally emitted light of the planet to detect the Doppler shift of the planet itself. And this is orders of magnitude larger than the velocity change of the star. So we do that. Um, by being able to remove the stellar features and digging down into the noise and doing a cross-correlation with the observed data and cross-matching that with templates to pull out the planetary signal. Now, the kind of templates that we're looking at, when we go to very high resolutions, this is of order of 100,000, um, are very unique, and they have um, unique patterns of lines. Each molecule contains its own unique fingerprint. And we can trace through the data that we have, um, cross-correlating, to see if we pick up um, these molecules. 
Now, carbon monoxide and even oxygen are relatively simple molecules. They're well described um, by laboratory measurements. Um, but for other potential biomarkers, they're very complex. And so the question was, for example, water, would this technique be able to pull that out? Are the line positions in these templates accurate enough? Have they been measured accurately enough in the lab for the temperatures and pressures that we need to look at in planetary atmospheres um, to actually be able to pull out the signal? And so obviously I wouldn't be standing here if this didn't work. So um, here's an ex example of detecting um, water in a non-transiting planet. This is 51 Peg B, which you might be familiar with as one of the very first um, exoplanets. And what's key to pick up is that this technique, because it measures the velocity of the planet, and from the Doppler wobble technique, we also have the velocity of the star, it gives a velocity ratio which is equal to the mass ratio of the system. And given that we often know the stellar mass pretty well, it means we can get true masses for non-transiting planets rather than just a lower limit. So with this technique, we can measure a true mass for Proxima b, um, uh, which is an, an important um, parameter in understanding, again, its atmosphere, its evolution history, and whether or not it might host life. So this isn't a, a one-trick pony. Um, the technique itself, using infrared high-resolution spectroscopy, this has been done on the uh, very large telescopes, an eight-meter telescope with an instrument called CryRes, um, we readily, not necessarily easily, but we do readily detect um, signatures of carbon monoxide in non-transiting planets, um, and it, also in transiting planets, the technique works regardless of the inclination. Um, but these are all hot Jupiters, um, and they're very hot in the infrared. However, Proxima b is pretty cool, and in fact it's probably about Earth temperature. And so the contrast ratio between the star and the planet is small. For, for a hot Jupiter, that ratio is order of 1,000, 10,000 times fainter for the planet. But in the infrared for Proxima b, here I'm just showing the contrast ratio of a black body curve for the planet and the star. We see that until we sort of reach 5 microns, we're still down at the 10 to the minus 7 level in the contrast ratio. However, in reflected light, if we assume an albedo or amount of reflectance similar to the Earth, we find that we probably expect it to be maybe an order of magnitude larger than the infrared signature. And also, consider this. Because Proxima is so close to us, the angular separation of the planet and the star system on the sky is relatively large compared to what we might find for other further away systems. And so, if we go to the optical, where we're more sensitive to reflected light, we also have um, a closer in diffraction limit, so we can actually start to resolve out um, the planet directly itself, um, and even to the point where we could start thinking about doing this already with six and a half meter telescopes, and once we reach the era of the ELTs, we'll be well um, inside to be able to detect the um, diffraction. So why does it matter that we need to go to the optical, and what does that mean for the technique? Well, in the optical, we're not looking directly at the spectrum of the planet itself. The planet is a mirror, and it reflects what it sees. And at high resolution, what it sees is a high resolution spectrum of the star, and all it does is it just Doppler shifts that signature. So we need to be able to disentangle a very faint spectrum of the star that is Doppler shifted from a very strong spectrum of the star itself. Um, however, the planet is not a good mirror. It will probably not be a perfectly reflecting mirror, and if we look at Earth's reflection spectrum, what we find is as a function of wavelength, we see that reflectance is not perfect, which would be all the way across here up at one, but for all of our different molecules, and especially our biomarkers, the oxygen, the water, um, that there are very strong features. And so when we detect at high resolution this reflected stellar spectrum, that spectrum will be modulated by the reflectance of the planets. So that can tell us about its composition, can maybe tell us about its clouds, maybe about its internal energy, and even its evolution history. So this attempt to do this in the optical, looking at reflected light, hasn't really been proven yet for this technique. So it's something that I'm trying to do at the moment. So the very best reflection <laughs> spectrum that we have for an exoplanet at the moment, it's a hot Jupiter, um, are these two measurements. This comes from HST. Um, this was done in, by Tom Evans in 2013. And my goal is, is to try and do this with a Harps North, which is on a three and a half meter ground-based telescope. A Harps North is an extremely stable um, spectrograph. 
And the idea is, is to make these measurements in these smaller wavelength bins and start to pick out some detail in here. Um, and so the very preliminary result of doing this from just one quarter of the data that I have literally just finished collecting <laughs> um, is that maybe, unfortunately, the uh, contours don't come up very well here, but there is a slightly brighter contour that's this kind of size on my screen <laughs> um, that shows beginning from a quarter of this data, we have maybe approaching a three sigma detection of reflection from, again, 51 peg B. So what does that mean? for Proxima and, and what kind of facilities do we need to be able to do this? Well, because Proxima is so close, we can actually use not only its velocity information, but also its spatial separation to really help us tease out that signature of the planet that's 10 million times fainter than the star. And, and so to do this, not only do we need a opt high resolution optical spectrograph, but we actually want an integral field unit. Okay, we want to be able to take spectra as a function of position, um, and then be able to remove the stellar spectrum, and that just leaves us with our um, planet reflection um, sig signature popping up. And so last year, we actually did some simulations predicting how the uh, EELT would respond um, if it had an optical IFU, and what that might be for a Proxima B-like system. Um, but we got some of the numbers a bit wrong. We were a bit optimistic about the radius and the temperature, and we had a slightly smaller separation. And so we estimated 10 hours would give us a 10, uh, signal noise of 10 for the detection of, uh, of, of the planet. However, the signal to noise goes as a function of the contrast ratio, which depends on the planet radius and the separation. And so if we plug in the real values for this, I'll show you on the next slide how the numbers change. This is just to highlight all the different things that we can do <laughs> to uh, improve the signal to noise. So if we want to change the contrast ratio, we need to reduce the stellar signal at the planet position. We can do that with adaptive optics, um, suppress the light over here, this value here. And if we have a wide wavelength coverage, the more lines we detect, the stronger the signal. And so um, the estimates were for instead of 10 hours on the EELT, this scales to 40 hours or about four nights. But for the GMT, this would be on the order of 100 hours to get a 10 a uh, signal noise of 10 on the detection of reflection from Proxima B and to be able to say something about its atmosphere. However, the advantage with the GMT is one that it has optical instruments already planned and that we might even be able to start as early as 2021 um, with a four mirror configuration and that there are instruments already that are being explored to do this work, combining um, AO systems like Sphere and Espresso on the VLT, but also um, on the US side, looking into combining MAGAO and the optical IFU, RIA, um, at Magellan over the coming um, two years. Um, so I'll just leave you my conclusions that this, may, this technique may be the only way we have to characterize our very nearest um, planetary systems, um, and that high-resolution spectrographs with adaptive optics are an essential resource for the future of exoplanet characterization. Thanks. additional planets in the system. Um, yeah, I mean, I think they're still monitoring it um, to pull this out. Um, Jupiters are less expected around this type of star. Um, and if there was a Jupiter... Do they... They don't see uh, from imaging... Um, I don't think there's any direct imaging of Proxima B that's been done that shows any far out Jupiter like planets yet. Um, you, could, you could, if you knew precisely where it would be. Yeah, but even, even with just a long slit, you still have that spatial information. So it still works. You still get the um, advantage of combining both the movement and that. So, yeah, most slits are like 0.2 arc seconds, I guess. So you could just 
blast it over. But it helps to have the 2D information because then you can reconstruct the orbit very well as well. Yeah, which is, is unknown. Then this uh, uh, star approximates a number of uh, uh, triple, right? Yeah. Semi, sorry, um, proxima. Alpha semi, alpha semi yeah. A and B. Yeah. Uh, and um, the question is, can you also look at those with the same technique or, or are they too bright for that? Um, yeah, no, so we did the simulation for Alpha, for, for an Earth, so Alpha Sen A is more solar-like star. Um, so if you put an Earth at 1 AU um, and take this um, IFU approach to doing that in the infrared, it's something like 30 hours to look at Alpha Sen to detect a 1 AU Earth-like system with a precise like copy of Earth's uh, spectrum. That was part of the simulations that we did. Mm -hmm. Would the reflected spectrum at some angles look polarized? Um, potentially, but it would be extremely faint, and I think it would be very difficult to pull that out at the moment. It could be actually a fair fraction at certain instants, and the star goes away. Yeah, so there are, there are people that are looking into okay. to, to doing that. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, oh, right. Uh, I don't know how, when the clock starts. Um, I was going to say two things. One about a survey that we are doing with ALMA to study the dense gas history of the universe. Uh, amazing instrument, ALMA. Um, is that working? Good. And if I have time, uh, is there a clock I can see? It may come up on my machine, actually. Uh, um, if I have time, I might mention uh, the next generation very large array. I mean, the idea is that you know, over time, sorry, here we go. Over time, we have studied you know the the star formation history of the universe. The, you know, the star formation rate density as a function of redshift. It's sort of uh, okay, a nauseating detail, um, and it really is you know. A, a real legacy of the, the various deep fields that are done with the space telescope and in the radio and the submillimeter, et cetera, really quantified from the, you know, the rise from the early universe reionization up to, you know, a peak, the epoch of galaxy assembly, redshift two, the, where, you know, half the stars form in the universe, and then the inevitable decline as galaxies run out of gas, as, as I'll show you. Uh, now, if you accept the idea that there is some kind of a star formation law, Right, a relationship between the star formation rate and the gas mass, as let's say quantified by the far infrared and the CO luminosity, I'm talking about molecular gas mass here. If you accept these star formation laws, then in fact the star formation history of the universe should be somehow reflected in the dense gas history of the universe. There should be some kind of a rise and fall in the gas properties of galaxies with redshift. Okay, it's sort of a simple logic. Uh, and in fact, one might argue this is more fundamental than that, well, Wrong statement. This is sort of half the puzzle of galaxy formation in terms of baryons. You know, there's the gas and there's stars, and how does that process go? And in fact, with the major new instruments we have, ALMA, JVLA, and NOEMA, the, I would say that the focus of the study of galaxy formation is really shifting to the, the gas properties, because we have the capability now to do that. So I was going to describe a project that we're pursuing with, with ALMA, uh, one of the first large projects on ALMA in early science, so we only had 20 antennas. Uh, the, actually more, 35, depending on the observing, where we essentially did the first volumetric molecular deep field. Okay, we essentially picked a region in the UDF, small region, it's only an arc minute square, uh, and we scanned uh, in frequency ALMA's band 3 and 6, that's sort of 85 to 115 gigahertz, and I don't know, 220 to about 270 gigahertz. We scanned in frequency over this field. Uh, we get down to fairly low sensitivities, I'm talking about, uh, oh no, so if you think about that, here's the observed frequency versus redshift for the different CO transitions, the dominant molecular gas tracer, uh, and the carbon to it, uh, fine structure line at high redshift. And so we'll be picking up CO emission in this blind survey at different redshifts and different transitions, and then eventually possibly pick up carbon to emission from, from the first galaxies. Uh, there's a blind survey. We weren't targeting any galaxies in particular, so that's what's unique about this. 
Um, you know, we, our sensitivities are pushing down to what you might call the knee and the mass function, a few 10 to the 9 solar masses at high redshift. The dust continuum is really sensitive, Microjansky sensitivity. So we're seeing relatively uh, 10 solar masses per year at high redshift, uh, and actually that's independent of redshift roughly uh, due to the inverse K correction, and possibly, again, as I said, picking up carbon-2 uh, from very first galaxies. Uh, and I'll go through this quick. I you know, only 10 minutes. Um, important point here is a, uh, here's a couple of examples. This is our continuum deep field. Uh, types of things we see, large spiral galaxies, flocculent spiral at redshift 1.4, CO2 to 1 emission. Uh, a very faint galaxy here, possibly carbon-2 emission at redshift 6.7. To give you the raw numbers, we get 10, 11 candidate lines uh, in the different bands, 3 and 6. Band 3 is almost certainly all CO. Band 6 may be some combination of some CO detections or carbon-2. I should say all of this is published as of last month. So if you're looking for it, we have seven papers, and these are the authors, first authors on the various papers. So if any of these things strikes your fancy, please follow up. Uh, nine dust continuum sources uh, over this small field. Uh, Richard Bowen did an interesting stacking analysis taking LBG galaxies in the UDF, you know, the best multi-wavelength data available, and stacks a bunch of galaxies from redshifts 1 to 10 and re-derives the dust-corrected star formation history of the universe. Uh, so if that, if that you know, gets you going, that's good. Uh, we have a possible six detections of the carbon-2 line roughly uh, beyond a redshift 6 in line and break, can uh, line and break galaxy candidates. Um, that's the most speculative result that we got out of this. Uh, and then I published a paper on that sort of relates to cosmology in terms of CO intensity mapping and how foregrounds will contaminate um, spectral distortions of the CMB. I, I may mention that later. Uh, so here are the basic res here's sort of the, the physics or the astrophysics or astronomy result. Uh, and I think this is actually, you know, galaxy formation is a bloody mess. And you look for certain things that are, you know, potentially good and true and tell you something about, uh, you know, galaxy formation itself. And this is one of them that I really like. And this is the ratio between the molecular gas mass and the stellar mass as a function of redshift for what you would call main sequence or typical star-forming disk galaxies as a function of time. And you see this very interesting trend here. And essentially, our data have, have confirmed this, but now for the first time in a blind survey as opposed to picking out galaxies from other surveys in the optical. Uh, and the, this, 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 uh, the, this, this ratio, the baryon fraction, increases by really an order of magnitude from redshift zero, where the, you know, in the Milky Way active star forming galaxy, we have 10 times more stars and gas in terms of mass, uh, total mass. Um, 10 times more stars than gas. Did I say that right? So, yeah. Um, and then this goes up by almost an order of magnitude when you get to the peak epoch of galaxy formation at about a redshift of two. So you reach a point where the average galaxy actually becomes dominated by gas and not stars. Maybe that doesn't surprise anybody, but I find that fascinating. Um, and here is one extreme example, redshift 2.5, uh, of a galaxy which has actually apparently 10 times the gas mass than the stellar mass. Right. Maybe we expected this when we moved back in the early universe, but uh, it really is a fundamental change in, gas pro uh, in, in the properties of galaxies. They become gas-dominated versus stellar-dominated. Uh, so you can put that into a plot here, uh, the, den uh, the dense gas history of the universe in the first, uh, for the first time done in a blind way. Admittedly, we only have like 20, gal 20 uh, candidates, so the error bars are going to be big. But there appears to be you know, this rise and fall uh, with a, a tremendous uncertainty, right? Um, which potentially follows the rise and fall of the star formation history of the universe. By the way, this is the new Bowens uh, plot for the star formation history of the universe with dust correction. Important take home point the epoch of uh, peak cosmic star formation rate uh, are also corresponds to the epoch when galaxies are dominated by gas and not stars. Uh, one word on the cosmology application. Um, uh, I just show this here. People are looking to, for spectral distortions in the microwave background with very, very sensitive future experiments like PIXI. Um, we can add up all the lines in our, uh, in our survey and ask what is the mean brightness temperature. And it turns out it's about one Kelvin, and that's a lower limit because there's going to be... Fi huh? What did I say? Kelvin? One micro Kelvin. Good. <laughs> um, you know, it, that's a lower limit because there are fainter sources in there. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, that's much higher than the sensitivity of Pixie here. Um, so you're going to have to deal with these foregrounds if you want to have a sensitivity limited instrument in the future. Uh, one last slide on this. Uh, we have now been given a second large project, uh, Aspects 2. We're granted time. Now we have 150 hours total uh, with ALMA. Um, it's observing starts in December. We're going to cover a five times larger area and go deeper over at least part of the area. Um, observing starts next month. And in this case, if all goes to plan, we could have a much better constrained evolution of the, in a blind sense, of the gas properties of galaxies. Um, and how am I doing for time? Ouch. Uh, well, let me just mention we are, uh, the NRAO and the community are considering a large project, the Next Generation VLA, which would be a telescope operating from 1 to 115 gigahertz that has essentially 10 times the capabilities of the current instrumentation, ALMA and the JVLA, in terms of sensitivity and resolution. And what will that do? That will really push us into a new regime detecting, here's the Next Generation VLA sensitivity versus the current instrumentation, uh, detecting thousands of galaxies, right, in deep surveys as opposed to 10. And that really takes us to HST-like galaxy densities um, and uh, also doing high-resolution imaging, which I won't mention. But in that case, you really tie down this evolution of the dense gas in the universe. And I want to emphasize the, the complementarity here where uh, future telescopes like uh, uh, TMT and JWST are going to be uh, pushing this, these kinds of studies um, uh, into, you know, in real gory detail, and the NGVLA will certainly be following suit on that. Um, and let me just leave it at that then. Thank you. Yeah, so there are three techniques for deriving the molecular gas masses in distant galaxies. One is through the CO luminosity, and that requires conversion. The other is through the far infrared luminosity, and that requires conversion. And the, uh, and the last is the star formation rate, however you estimate it. And that requires a conversion, which is... Now, do they all match up? Um, it depends who you talk to, and uh, it, it, it depends on how you feel the relationship between the gas mass and the star formation rate really goes. Is there, you know, a, a dual sequence of starbursts and, normal, and, and, and main sequence galaxies? I've focused on the main sequence galaxies. So uh, you can get it to fit if you like. But right now that calibration remains uh, under debate. We know, for example, that dwarfs actually don't often follow the Kenneth Schmidt law. Like some dwarfs have oh, a lot of yeah, star, awesome. high star forming uh, or high, high density gas uh -huh. and not a lot of star formation. So they sort of track off that relationship. Right. So have you seen in your sample any indication that of high redshift things don't look similar to you know most spiral galaxies at low redshift? <laughs> so things look more like some of these dwarfs that have a lot of molecular uh, gas. Yeah. Well, that, that, that comes, I mean, this example here might fit into, am I in the right place? Might fit into what you're talking about. It's got a ton of molecular gas, and the star formation rate isn't that high. So I'm not sure if that actually falls in the Kenny Schmidt relationship or not. I'd have to look at, go back to the paper. Um, of course, we're just measuring the CO. And, and so we're not really worried whether, they, how closely they track each other. We're just making the molecular gas measurement. Uh, that's right. And in this case, we assume a, a galactic type value, right? If it's smaller, then this number goes down. But um, actually, there's a physical lower limit to what it could be for optically thin emission. Um, and even in that case, the gas mass is larger than the stellar mass. I think the bigger question here is how do you derive a stellar mass? This could, there's a lot of questions about dust.
Okay. Um, as uh, as Avi mentioned earlier, um, I I just gave a talk, so um, I won't impose too much um, on your time. In my second talk, can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so I'll be talking about a paper which uh, we recently put on the archive, and um, I'll just be kind of skimming over the white caps. And the, the motivation is this. Um, is there a pointer somewhere? Oh, no, you didn't. You left it here. Um, which end is which? OK. Um, so this is the cosmic ray spectrum, uh, many orders of magnitude and energy. Uh, this barely perceptible feature here is called the knee. Um, and this uh, slightly more pronounced feature is called the ankle. And in between, about 3 PeV and about 1 EeV, there's this region that we, that we call the shin. And the question is, what is the origin of these particles? They're um, a bit high in energy to be accelerated by um, standard galactic supernova remnants. So what is their origin? Um, more ambitiously, can the ultra-high energy cosmic rays that are not in confined to galaxies be accelerated at uh, termination shocks? And finally, how does the termination shock of a galactic wind affect the cosmic ray output or luminosity of a galaxy? So um, the, the results, the specific results that I show will be based on a very simple family of thermally driven galactic wind models uh, that uh, Chad and Elena and I published last year. They're spherically symmetric, they're steady state, they're thermally driven, and they're radiatively cooled wherever that becomes important. And uh, you'll see a lot of plots like this. Uh, asymptotic wind velocity from 500 to 4,000 kilometers a second, uh, and the mass loss rate in solar masses a year. And uh, the color coding represents the location of the termination shock, which is where the dynamical pressure in the wind uh, is balanced against the intergalactic or circumgalactic pressure uh, of the ambient medium. And you can see that these termination shocks are characteristically pretty far from the disk of the galaxy, 100 kiloparsecs or more. Let me remind you basically how diffusive shock acceleration is thought to work. So these, um, these lines here represent the uh, background magnetic field. And there are some little waves on them. Uh, here is the flow. So we're in the frame of the shock. Here's the incoming flow. Here's the slower outgoing flow. And a cosmic ray particle that's reflected off the shock and travels upstream will gain energy to PV in. And if it then goes back across the shock and uh, overtakes another fluctuation, it'll lose. But since V out is less than V in, there's a net energy gain per loop. So this is called a first order Fermi process. And it's considered the prime candidate for uh, galactic uh, cosmic ray acceleration. By assuming, uh, setting an upper bound on the rate at which particles can cross and recross the shock, uh, a long time ago, Lagage and Cesarski uh, came up with an upper limit for how fast particles could be energized in diffusive shock acceleration. And it depends on the uh, speed of the shock and the charge of the ion and the magnetic field. Now, if we just scale the galactic magnetic field out to 100 kiloparsecs, um, it's very small and you can't really get anywhere. But if we uh, take a cue from recent work on magnetic field amplification in shocks um, and assume that the field is actually amplified up to equipartition with the shock, which is about as much as you could imagine, um, then you can get uh, a pretty respectable rate of energization. So here's the rate of energy gain um, in EV per <laughs> mega year. And these are the maximum energies that you can achieve as a function of shock velocity for three different intergalactic pressures from 10 to the minus 14 to 10 to the minus 16. And uh, this here kind of is the range of shin energy. And this is the uh, ultra high energy cosmic ray range of energies. And um, you can see that, uh, that it's possible to accelerate particles in the shin, uh, but maybe not the ultra high energy particles. That requires a very fast shock. Um, yeah. OK, so if we're interested in explaining the shit particles, we want to know if they actually make it back to the galaxy. So you can um, measure the relative importance of diffusion inward and advection outward by the wind by defining a sort of cosmic ray Reynolds number, 
which would be the shock radius, the shock velocity, divided by the diffusion coefficient for cosmic rays. And um, the energy dependence is not too well known and turns out to be kind of important uh, for what is to follow, which I'll show you now. So here is a plot, um, shock velocity, shock radius, shock velocity, shock radius, um, of the minimum energy such that this cosmic ray Reynolds number is less than one. So cosmic rays more energetic than this energy have a good chance of making it back to the galaxy. Here on the left, we assume that the diffusion coefficient scales as e to the 0.3. Uh, and here on the right, that it goes as e to the 0.6. And you can see that with this uh, weaker scaling with energy, basically nothing makes it back. They're all blown out. Um, but if you, if you have a, a more pronounced scaling, uh, a lot of stuff comes back. And we wound up settling on kind of a compromise value. So what are the definite predictions for our wind models? So here's two different views of that. Uh, central temperature, asymptotic velocity. So there's a very tight scaling law. Basically, the asymptotic wind velocity in these models is just the central sound speed in the galaxy. And here is the same data plotted um, with mass loss rate against wind velocity. And there's, you can get a lot of scatter in that plot. And you can see that for the faster winds that correspond to the higher central temperatures, it is possible to get um, well above 10 to the 17 eV and populate the shin, at least accelerate particles to that energy. And um, this kind of continues the trend. It's the faster shocks that make the more energetic cosmic rays. But bear in mind that it's also the faster shocks that um, exist further from the galaxy. So here's the same data, but now the only points in color are uh, the represent cosmic rays that can make it back to the disk that have a, a Reynolds number less than one. And you can see that these plots are uh, just a pallid shadow of the uh, ones on the previous slide. So there's this whole range of gray points here representing cosmic rays that are accelerated but just blown outward with the wind. And uh, the same thing here on this m dot uh, wind velocity plane. By the way, um, we have a model for the wind of the Milky Way, uh, and it sits about over here. It's fairly feeble over the range of models that we consider. So what is the luminosity of a galaxy in cosmic rays? with our assumptions. So if we assume that 10% of the shock energy is, is converted to cosmic rays, which is about what happens for galactic supernova remnants, um, we get the, this range of luminosities, 10 to the 40 to 10 to the 43. And most of these cosmic rays, as we saw from the previous slide, um, are just convected outward into the intergalactic medium. Very few of them make it back to the galaxy. So what are the conclusions of this work? So with these very generous assumptions about magnetic field amplification up to equipartition and 100 mega years to, um, of the shock in a steady state, galactic wind termination shocks uh, can accelerate, this should be accelerate, cosmic rays up to the energy of the shin. Um, going to ultra high energy cosmic rays, rain, energy range is more problematic. And most of the particles actually propagate into the intergalactic medium rather than back to the galaxy. Thanks. Well, that's a fun, that's a fun idea. So, um, so our model of the, in our model of the galactic wind, so there's actually um, pretty good evidence that the galactic wind, the Milky Way, does not cover the whole sky. Um, and our model is, is actually sort of a thick shower curtain that hangs over the uh, three kiloparsec molecular ring and, and then goes up. So um, is M31 overhead? Or where is M31 relative to the... 
So maybe the wind, maybe the winds hit each other. That's an interesting idea. Thank you. That would be fun. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, so at one EEV in the galactic magnetic field, so a few microgauss, um, it's uh, about a kiloparsec, a little more than a kiloparsec. Um, so one of the reasons that we think that um, the very high energy cosmic rays don't come from galactic supernova rooms is that their gyro radii are bigger than the shock. Um, and that's one reason why galactic wind termination shocks are so attractive, because they're huge geometrical extent. And, and actually, um, the, the Larmor radius is small for all, you know, the 100 kiloparsec scale cosmic rays that, um, or sorry, shocks that we're considering here. So, Ellen, your plot, you were showing uh, central temperatures up to a few to the 8 Kelvin. Yeah. What temperature is this? doesn't look like a galaxy scale temperature. What um, is it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So, um, so I, I sort of had the courage to go on with this, uh, thanks to Jay Gallagher. Um, so, the, so this gas, so a lot of what we know about hot gas in galaxies is, say, the, you know, up to the 8 kilovolts from ROSAT or something like that. Um, if there is hotter gas, it is harder to see. But I don't know. You know, it may be too high. It may be too high. These thousands of kilometers second flows, it may be too hot. It may be too high. Um, but that's what you need. Well, you need let's. To produce fast enough uh, waves. Um, yeah, with, with a model, with a thermally driven model. With a thermally driven model. With a therm now, there are other, are con other cosmic ray, et cetera, driving uh, possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. So actually, to get up to, um, you know, sort of into the knee range, yeah, you need a couple hundred million degrees. You need wind velocities of 2,500 to 3,000 kilometers a second. But, you know, really the more fundamental quantity here is the wind velocity, because how it's produced, you know, that's, the, that's a particular feature of our model. So the rate of particle acceleration, yes, depends on magnetic field strength. Um, but of course, there, the, the acceleration process particles spend some time in the downstream and some time in the upstream. And presumably, the upstream magnetic field is much weaker than the downstream because their amplification is only very modest, I believe. So I wonder. Well, right. So, um, so I actually had a slide that I removed for lack of time about the amplification mechanisms. So um, there's the kinetic turbulence, the Bell models. Um, there's uh, amplification by cosmic. There are both upstream and downstream mechanisms that depend on the um, some sort of clumpy structure in the medium. And um, you know, with or without cosmic rays, you can generate vorticity and amplify the field. And I'm not sure. Um, you know, I my impression is these things are a bit squishy, but. We try to be as optimistic as possible. Hello, everyone. Uh, for some reason, this is not okay. There we go. All right, and there's no clock here. That's okay. So I'm going to be talking uh, with you about and now about uh, calibrating uh, radio interferometers. And so why why do we care so much about calibrating radio interferometers? Uh, well, the particular application I'm going to be discussing uh, is that is within the next several years we hope to constrain the properties of the first galaxies and compact objects and stars in the universe 
uh, by observing their impact on the intergalactic medium uh, that exists between the galaxies. Uh, and in particular, we're looking at the neutral hydrogen in that, in that intergalactic medium. And so when the first uh, stars and black holes form, they set up radiation fields that heat and ionize the hydrogen. And that uh, heating and reionization impacts uh, emission at, from the hyperfine transition of that hydrogen. So it comes out at 21 centimeters, and it is redshifted to 2 meters where we hope to observe it uh, with a radio telescope. Well, all right. And we, ideally what we want is we want pictures of the intergalactic medium as a function of redshift uh, going all the way out from reionization out to around a redshift of 200. Uh, but within the next several years, we are really expecting to make a statistical detection of this emission. And in particular, we're targeting the, the power spectrum of this emission, where you take a Fourier transform uh, in the spatial dimensions, and then you average in spherical bins, uh, taking advantage of the isotropy of the emission field to build up sensitivity. And since reionization is, kind of, is sort of at the uh, lowest redshift, where we really expect to see this stuff coming from the IGM, we might see it from galaxies at lower redshift, uh, and the foregrounds become brighter at higher redshift, reionization is where we're really trying to target this signal. Uh, and as I mentioned foregrounds before, the main challenge to this measurement is the fact that the foregrounds, including the galaxy we live in, and all of the radio loud and radio quiet uh, AGN that exists between us and redshift 6 uh, are, are together around 10 to the 4 times brighter than this signal. And uh, this is, so this is the main challenge of the measurement, but we hope to actually achieve isolation of these foregrounds by taking advantage of their spectral properties. And in particular, the foreground radio emission is coming from synchrotron radiation, and so it is well described by a smooth function. And the signal, since it's a line measurement from different redshifts, each frequency we see we measure corresponds to a different distance along the line of sight. And so we expect the signal to have very fine spectral features because each uh, frequency is a different patch of hydrogen with a different uh, physical state. And so if you take a Fourier transform in the line of sight direction along frequency, your foregrounds, will, although they are much brighter, will pile up at small uh, line of sight wave numbers. And there will be a region at sufficiently large line of sight wave numbers uh, where the signal will exceed the foregrounds. Now this is complicated a little bit by the way we actually uh, measure the power spectrum. So now what I'm showing here is a, a plot that you, we like to make a lot within the 21 centimeter uh, interferometry community which is showing, uh, it's, a, it's a Fourier spice plot, and it's showing wave numbers perpendicular to the line of sight on the x-axis, and wave numbers parallel to the line of sight on the y-axis. And, and the way we actually uh, measure this emission with an interferometer is we essentially correlate the electric fields that are measured by different pairs of antennas on the ground. And the distance between the antennas corresponds to a different wave number perpendicular to the line of sight. Foregrounds uh, are, are going to have frequency structure uh, that is going to go out to, uh, at most, the delay betw uh, between the electric signals arriving at the two antennas. And so as you go to larger antennas, uh, the delay that a foreground can occupy increases. And remember, de delay, it turns out, is the Fourier dual to frequency, uh, which is why it ends up being uh, proportional to the line of sight wave number. And so all the foregrounds end up occupying what we call the wedge, and all the signal we expect to occupy what we call the EOR window. Uh, and so uh, this is where calibration becomes very important now, uh, because it's all about making sure the foregrounds you measure are smooth. So in principle, if your interferometer has a, a wiggle in the gain of an antenna, what will happen is that gain will be multiplied by your foregrounds. And by introducing sig uh, frequency structure into, into your foregrounds, you're going to put some of your foregrounds uh, in the EOR window. And it turns out you end up getting a convolution between the gain of your antenna uh, and the uh, Fourier transform of your foregrounds. And, then, and as a result of this, some of the early uh, upper limits on the 21 centimeter power spectrum that have come out in the last several years uh, have really been dominated by uncalibrated spectral features in the instrument. So for example, uh, this, is a, this is a measurement around Redshift 7 by uh, Joshua Dillon. Uh, you can see that there's a lot of foreground uh, power within the wedge, which is what we expect, but there are also these striped features that exist outside of the wedge. And th uh, this is where we want to measure the signal. Uh, and 
those features will prevent us from doing so. Uh, and the same is true at Redshift 16. Here's a one-dimensional power spectrum now by uh, Adam Beardsley. Again, you've got these features uh, that exceed the thermal noise uh, level that we would expect for this integration. So uh, this, is, this is not a new problem in radio astronomy, but astronomy by any means. Uh, you've always had to calibrate your instrument. And so, but there are subtleties in the calibration that I'll now discuss that really impact 21 centimeter. So what is the calibration problem that we actually have to solve? Well, we have a bunch of visibilities, and this is basically the cross-correlation between electric fields for all of our antenna pairs. Uh, and that measured visibility is equal to the gain, the product of the gains on the two antennas multiplied by the true intrinsic visibility of your foregrounds and signal. And so uh, the, the name of the game here is to figure out what those gains are and divide them out. And so what do we have to work with when we're doing calibration? Well, we have uh, n times n minus 1 over two pairs of antennas. Uh, and the number of things we don't know uh, is we don't know n complex gains, and we don't know n times n minus 1 over 2 true measurements. And so uh, using no other information, it would be impossible uh, to obtain our gains. However, uh, what, radio, what radio astronomers usually do is they point their radio telescope at a source that is well understood, and they assume uh, a model for that source. And, and as a result, you get rid of these true visibilities, and then you have a lot more measurements than you have unknowns, and you can solve for your gains. And the problem with this, and so this, all right, so this is, so the radio telescopes that are doing this right now are the MWA and LOFAR, uh, and the SK quite possibly will also rely on this technique. And uh, the problem for 21 centimeter is that uh, every model you're going to calibrate on is imperfect at some level, and this is just due to the fact that uh, you're going to construct a model with a radio interferometer with some finite resolution, uh, and that resolution will give you some confusion limit below which you won't be able to characterize the sources. And at the same time, uh, the, 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 for, the, the sky that you're seeing is being viewed through your antenna, uh, whose gain pattern you also don't necessarily know to high precision. And the uh, naive thinking on this problem earlier was that uh, your, your foregrounds are smooth in frequency, so if you get them wrong by a little bit, your frequency errors are going to be smooth as well. If you multiply by smooth frequency errors, who cares? Uh, those errors should still stay within the EOR window. But this is not the reality. Uh, the reality is that when you're trying to figure out the gain for one antenna, you're using information from all of the visibilities that that antenna participates in. And those different visibilities are going to vary in length, the baselines for those visibilities, uh, and, and depending on the length of those baselines, the, the errors in the model that you're using are going to have frequency structure that's going to go out to the delay uh, of the horizon corresponding to that visibility. And so what will happen is your gain is going to end up having errors in it that are going to go out to at most the delay uh, of the longest visibility that you're using for calibration. And so then, when you apply that gain uh, to every one of your shorter baselines, you're going to introduce those errors on your longest baseline into the shorter baselines, and you're going to put power inside of the EOR window where we want to measure the signal. And so what this effectively does is it turns the wedge into a brick. So uh, ordinarily, so the wedge here now, these are calculations from the paper we wrote on this. Uh, there's, so this, this line here is the wedge, and ordinarily you shouldn't have power outside of it. Uh, but when you have these errors, they end up spreading power uh, outside of, of the wedge into the EOR window. And there are also these contours that show the ratio between these errors and a, and a, and a particular model of the 21 centimeter signal that's reasonable. Uh, and you see that uh, for many of these telescopes, there's really nowhere where the this, where this signal is uh, greater uh, than this bias that's introduced by these calibration errors. So uh, what is the solution we came up with for this? Well, uh, so when you actually solve for your gains, uh, what, we, what, we, what, we, what we prescribe in this paper is you actually weight uh, each visibility that you're using to solve, to solve each equation uh, by a Gaussian factor that downweights uh, visibilities by the length of the baseline. And so when you do this, it cleans everything up. Uh, and so, uh, so this will hopefully allow for imaging arrays uh, to be able to calibrate and measure the 21 centimeter signal. The other strategy that exists is redundant calibration, where you lay your antennas in a regular pattern, and because you're measuring uh, the same separation on the ground, 
many, many times, uh, then you get redundant measurements of the same true value, and uh, that reduces the number of true visibilities you're measuring, and you can still overconstrain your gains without relying on a model of the sky. Uh, and this is precisely what the HERA instrument is relying on right now, which is why the telescopes are laid out in a regular pattern. And we're building out to 240 elements. We got the money from the NSF. Assuming it's around for the next five years, uh, we'll maybe detect the signal. Thanks. <laughs> Why did you say that? Say what? Assuming it's around. Oh. They might have to cut the NSF. Yeah? There's another practical approach to calibrate. It's basically take a broad range with a known So that's true. So, the, so the, I would say right now that, that that technology is not really in a place where we have precision measurements yet. Uh, it is something that's being worked on, but um, and the other so and so, uh, it, but it isn't it, it isn't ready yet essentially. Um, no, you can do it with like a several thousand dollar uh, cheap optocopter. Uh, I guess the other problem is a lot of these radio telescopes are in RFI quiet areas. So you have to get into all, all kinds of politics. Although I'm sure that's something that could be worked out. Uh, I would say right now, the main limitation is just that those drones are in an early stage of deployment, uh, yeah. development, time. yeah, and time. Yeah. If you're doing your time variable, that's what you do. You can't just look at now and apply it to the hours. Okay, can you measure it in real time? Almost like you have this transmission ability for the beginning. And it's at one frequency. Well, that's the orb comm that's at one frequency, but a drone could do. A drone might be a broadband signal, but then you can't make the measurement. You cannot find there and actually try to find the scope of one frequency. I guess you could have some kind of gating system. I guess the, the main. You can fly over a dish at two, three frequencies, you know, you think of batteries that last a certain amount of time. Yeah. Try and recharge the batteries, they occasionally explode. And you also you have 240 antennas to measure. So, uh, and it takes like an hour to do one of these antennas. Yeah. You could also do pulse well, injection. You have to make a part of the I mean, this is all trackable, but I don't know if you can do it continuously. Um, but let's see. Maybe that's what yeah. Yeah, it is exciting, I'll tell you. So how many antennas for HERA are already in There are 19 right now. Uh, well, there are 19 that are, uh, that are observing now. Uh, and there's actually close to 37 that are constructed. Yeah. Where, where is that? This is in the Karoo in South Africa.